Ken, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. I'm good. Thank you. Cool. I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, part of the ethos of this show, you know, is really trying to open people's eyes to the world of opportunity that they have to define their own careers um, and to get really intentional about the decisions that they make. And I think one of the biggest skills that I find is missing in that equation for a lot of people is viewing many of their decisions, specifically decisions around career through an investing lens, right? Having you're giving something and you have an expected return on that. And I think that's, that's missing. And so I want to start out with, it's very clear to me that the ROI on a college education for most people is broken. Um, and so it, alternatives such as blue collar careers and trade jobs have been on my radar for a long time. I just want to open with, you know, tell me about your views on this subject. And then why are blue collar jobs, trade jobs, maybe the answer to for a lot of people? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, if you look at the efficiency of any system, and let, let's just talk about the efficiency of supply and demand in the United States today. That is a force that is rarely reckoned with unless it's manipulated in some way. So when I look at systems that are, are, are the most efficient, I try to think of, okay, like you said, what's my ROI? What's my best bang for my buck? And, you know, we talk a lot about college and I'm not an anti-college guy. I'm an anti-colleges for everybody guy. And, um, if you look at the fact that there's 167 million people in this country that are working at any one time, 76 million of those people do something with their hands. And so you can see that the blue collar field is a very, very important and, and very steady and, and will continue to be down the road. Now, when you talk about college, right now, 40% of the kids that are going into college are going in as undecided, which to me means, what am I doing here? Or I don't know yet. Um, 25% of those, those kids graduate with a degree that they don't get a job in. They don't use it in, the, in their field. And the, I think one of the, the most sobering statistics is 35% of people that get a full four-year college degree never use that degree in their whole career. So if you compare that with the debt that you have when, you, when you're accumulating debt inside, and, and you, you kind of balance that against starting out in a blue collar career, it's kind of a no brainer if, if college isn't for you. Yeah, right, exactly. So what, it, what about the blue collar career path, I guess, helps people to um, maybe get more of a bead on what they're gonna do or, or at least learn more applicable skills to what they ultimately end up doing? Well, I, I look at it this way. When you're in a blue collar career, you, you control your own input. You control your own output. You usually control your own financing, okay, your own finances um, based on the first two. And because of all that, you can really build a life that you want the way you want your life to look for yourself. And, and I think that's one of the things that's missing. So many times we say, if I get a job and then I start making money, then my life will look like this. And I'm saying, let's do that the opposite way. Let's start out with what exactly do you want your life to look like, okay? In, in, in your best comfort, peace, and freedom moment, like we talk about in the book, what do you want that to look like? And then let's match a career that can get that for you. This is a little bit controversial, Mike, but sometimes when I look back on my career, you know, digging ditches was like 99th on the list of 100 things that I wanted to do, but it was a means to a lot of different and much better ends. And so sometimes I think, you know, if, if I've got my life really figured out what I want it to look like going forward, it may not be so important what I do for a living as it is what I do with what I do for a living. So uh, again, a blue collar career, there's so many awesome opportunities out there that are, that are you know, in demand and high paying. It's, uh, it's a great time to take advantage of that. There's a lot of great jumping off points there. Um, since you mentioned digging ditches, I want to go kind of back to uh, a little bit. I want to trace a little bit of your career arc, if you will. Can you tell me, and I, I ask every guest this question, can you tell me about your first job? Just it could be it could be as a child or uh, you know just whatever wherever you want to start with. Tell me about your first job. 
Well, you know, I, I had a bunch of little jobs like, you know, working, uh, delivering newspapers and working at a bakery sure. and working at a bowling alley, very part time when I was younger. But my first real job, you know, my high school uh, shared a fence with an industrial park and there was a hole in that fence. And we used to go into that uh, hole uh, through the fence and we would walk to the carry out, you know, after school and just kind of hang out. Well, every day that I walked by that industrial park, I saw this building that had all this activity. I mean, it had all the things that young kids liked. It had, you know, tractors and tow motors and backhoes, and it had uh, dump trucks and guys milling around. So one day I said, you know, what do you guys do here? And I was 15 at the time. And they said, well, we basically dig ditches and we repair old foundations. And I said, well, I can do that. And um, so I signed on with them back in, oh my gosh, in the early eighties. And, um, I'm still doing the same thing today, only in a different fashion. So I've been at my current job for about 42 years now, I hate to say, <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was like you said, you know, I, I learned a whole lot about what I wanted. I mean, at the time I wanted a used car. I wanted, you know, pizza and money for take my girlfriend out or movies or whatever, you know, buy some clothes or whatever. I wanted what every kid wanted. So I started with that vision and said, where can I find money to gain those things? And it just kept snowballing after that. So that's great. So did you go to college at all within, within that, that period? Did you ha yourself have the college experience? I, I really, you know, I, I went for about three months and I knew instantly that it wasn't for me. I, you know, I, I look at it this way. I, I took kind of the theory that, well, I could spend thirty or forty thousand dollars a year in college and do that for four years and come out with one hundred sixty thousand dollars in debt, or I could start working and probably earn forty thousand dollars a year and yeah. come out of that four-year period one hundred sixty thousand dollars to the plus side, which to me is a three hundred twenty thousand dollars swing in my asset base. <laughs> so it was a no-brainer for me to get right into the workforce because. I just knew that I could work with my hands and I could create things. And I enjoyed the stand back moment that a blue collar career brings to, to anyone who does it. And uh, so for me, it was a pretty easy decision to leave college and just get right into the, into the workforce. Yeah. It sounds like you had that investing lens that I kind of described earlier uh, from a really, really young age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that well, that's great. Uh, yeah. So, um, Oh, the, the, the other, thing that I wanted to, I guess, point out was you, you talked about, um, you know, kind of charting out what you're starting from the opposite direction as most people start. So charting out your life and what you want your life to look like. And maybe it doesn't matter exactly what you do for a living, because that's one small part of your life, right? A lot of, a lot of things that I talk about here are integrating, you know, your work with your life and how to do that much better. And again, I'm in, in more of the tech world and we, and, and I do focus a little bit more on that, but if you have that lens and you know what, what you want your life to look like, a, the, the acquisition of skill becomes way more important than the prestige of what you actually do, because that's what ends up creating all of the value. So I guess what I'm saying is, or where my question is, is now that you've had this track and you've written this book and you're mentoring a lot of younger people who come to you with questions, you know, where, where do they seem to be most stuck uh, as they work with you? Well, that, that's a really simple question to ask because I, I'm, I'm really actually surprised how ill-prepared um, our, our education um, system is for, for just basic life skills. I mean, I've hired, you know, I have a staff of 200 and over the last 40 years, we, we've probably hired a couple thousand people over that time to fill those construction positions. In many cases, it was their first job, which means I was coaching them on their first car, their first apartment, their first checking account, their first credit card, their first investment account. And it was amazing to me when I would ask them, what do you see your life looking like? They could only think to next Friday. Okay, and, and when I was going to get paid and what I was going to do this weekend. So we started creating these life drawings, these life boards, which is it's, it's not rocket science, Mike. It's we, we would take a big white um, uh, piece of poster board and a bunch, a bunch of crayons and we would say, start drawing what you want your life to look like. I mean, 
do you see yourself in a house, a condo, an apartment in the city? Do you see yourself as a, a, a pickup truck guy or gal or a motorcycle person or an electric vehicle or a bus rider? Do you see yourself as a pet owner? And if so, what kind of pet and what would you name it? Um, all the different things, your, your favorite charity give back moment, um, your favorite hobby, draw all this out on a piece of paper and say, okay, that's kind of my nirvana the way I see it right now. And then we just chop those things into small pieces and we go after them one piece at a time. And when someone says to themselves, wow, I now realize I'm in control of my own life and, and my own pieces and parts to that. They're like, get out of my way, Ken, and let me do the work. Really interesting. So it's like kind of the basic blocking and tackling. And I think then your, where your sauce comes in is saying like, guys, you don't have to, you don't have to necessarily become a lawyer or a doctor or whatever to accomplish that. There's like a, there's a really good pathway through what you're doing currently or in a, in a related you know, trade field to actually manifest that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen to what I mean, think about what they go through. First off, kids nowadays grow up with with cell phones and iPads, and that's where they do their designing and their construction work. Right. Where I had a hammer and a nail and I found some wood and nailed it to a tree and, you know, did whatever we did. Right. So they go through this almost um, surreal experience when it comes to being outside working with your hands. And then you take shop class out of high schools, which happened back in the 80s. And I think that was a big mistake. I mean, they replaced them with computers. And I thought, well, yeah, we, I know we need to learn computers, but couldn't we have had both? And, and then you, you have the, 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 I guess, the stigma of if you don't go to college, you're never going to amount to anything. And, and my gosh, Mike, nothing could be further from the truth there. I mean, we've got guys in our town, carpenters and plumbers and electricians that are making as much or more than family doctors. So it's, you really have to just stand back a second and say, wait a minute, this funnel to college is just this all encompassing thing. It's got too much power and we need to stand back and say, what other options do I have before I make that lifelong decision? Yeah. Uh, you're speaking my language. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I think you know, I, around here where I live, I know some roofers that are multimillionaires. You know, I, I think you would never suspect this, right? Or at least right? uh, someone, someone like me and my friends would never expect, you know, expect this, but, it, but it's there. Um, I think one of the things that's always, I guess, fascinated and puzzled me about, let's say, the roofer example or, you know, the carpenter example that is able to sort of achieve uh, some level of like financial freedom is like, where is the leverage in that career path? So by leverage, I mean, you know, I, I look at it as like, I'm, I'm selling my time, you know, and, and yes, my rates can go up. Um, but how does someone go from, you know, a few, let's say it's 50 bucks an hour to making millions, you know, roofing is that you, you have to create a business or are there other avenues to kind of attaining that level? Well, I can answer that in two ways. If this keeps going the way it is, you can just do your regular normal job by yourself and probably create that kind of money in the future, the way supply and demand is going. But, you know, it's really kind of simple to me. I think people, when they, when you think of starting their own business, they kind of really overcomplicate what that is. Yeah. And, and, and they, they put up all these barriers that don't belong. I mean, you know, back in the old days, we ran our company with, you know, spreadsheets and pencils and calculators and all that kind of stuff. But now you can run a company on your smartphone. I mean, if you have a pickup truck and a phone, you're everywhere you need to be. So I look at it this way. There has never been a better time in, in my entire life that it's been easier or more, um, more opportunistic than to start your own business in, in this environment. Because you can go to work for somebody and acquire some skills from them. They're going to love the fact that you just show up every day with a firm handshake and, and, you, and you look them in the eye. And they're going to share with you all the skills that they have. You can either move into managing their company for them and retire them eventually, or you can take those skills and find a couple of, of other people and, and start your own small business. And you know, if you think about $50 an hour for yourself, now multiply that times maybe some of the starter wages for those jobs, $26, $28, $30 an hour, 
where you're making money on um, you know, your crew and that's where you leverage and that's where you multiply. It's certainly what we did. I mean, we started with six people and now we have 200. So it's, it, it's a thing where you, you kind of leverage um, the, the, the efforts of everybody, but you take them with you on the journey. And I think that's the really important point. Right. Um, yeah. Building, building out a little, a little crew, as you, as you said, there's where the leverage can come in. Makes a lot of sense. You talked about supply and demand. And I think in, in, in this particular, this time in, in our lives, so we're, you know, mid 2021 and um, what you're really, I mean, I look around, I try to get some, try to hire somebody to come to my house to work on some heating or something. You can't get anyone building, building materials, you know, you can't get anyone. Is that how much a function, how much is that a function of just kind of crazy times right now, post COVID boom versus more the supply side and lack of skilled workers in these jobs? How how does, how, how does that play out? Well, uh, again, um, this problem didn't happen during the pandemic. It, it, it didn't happen, um, you know, a year before that. This has been coming on for a decade or so. You know, for every five electricians that retire today, only one comes online. So you can see right there, that's going to be a challenge in several years as these guys start to retire because the average age of an electrician is 55. So these people, this has been a challenge for, you know, 10 or 15 years, not just recently. And, and, and I, think, I think that's part of the misnomer of this thing. This is not going away, Mike. I mean, as long as you have kids that are growing up without the ability to experiment and discover shop class, without the ability to, di- to discover the trades, even by accident, um, carpentry, plumbing, electrician, machineries, um, you know, people that are uh, bakers and, and mechanics, if you don't have the ability to discover that, it's just going to continue to shrink, you know, the the source of where all those workers used to come from. And then this overselling of college, which people really have to wake up and say, wait, wait, time out. It it isn't possible for everyone to go to college because if it is, then who's going to fix the streets? Who's going to fix the the sewers? Who's going to do the things that we need to be done? And that's just going to put further pressure on the supply side of that and create even higher wage demand, which is again, a great opportunity for somebody still willing to put some, some really hard work in. Yeah, I think the, the college side of that is showing signs of, of cracking. I mean, we've got, yeah. as you and I were talking, I mean, you know, I think 25% of college students have been taking a gap year, right? And, and a lot of that's pandemic driven, right? But they're sort of saying like, wow, you know, I, I, went, I went online for a year uh, and didn't right. have the college experience, the full college experience, like, let me reevaluate here. So I think mm-hmm. like that, there, there's some signs there. And I think that the, the work that you do and, and that others do around educating people on kind of this ROI, uh, you know, equation, I think, I think works, but, but what, what do you think solves the, you know, the, the, the supply side, uh, the, the labor shortage uh, side of things? Like, I, do we need to be creating different apprentice programs or how, like, how do you see that sort of playing out? I, I think the very first thing that we need is to remove the stigma of doing one of these jobs. You know, um, I remember being uh, at, at a, a graduation party and, you know, at the graduation parties, all the parents like to talk about, well, my son is going here and my daughter's going there and, and, and all that stuff. And, and um, well, I, I heard one of these gals say, well, what is what's her name's son going to do? Oh, he, he's just going to be a plumber. And I laughed to myself because I thought, just going to be a plumber. Now, that person now, um, they have like six vans, 12 employees, and they're just absolutely killing it. But they're just a plumber. So I think the first thing we need to do is remove the stigma of, you know, not every kid's going to go to Harvard. Not every kid's going to be a rocket scientist. Not everyone's going to be a surgeon or a, or an attorney or a doctor or whatever. There is a need for things in this world. And if you have four kids, I can almost guarantee you that one or two of them might be better off in some tactile job that they can do rather than going to college and hoping that something good comes out the other side. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I've got three young boys, so four, seven, and nine. And I, I have conversations all the time with my wife and, and our friends. And I say, you know, I really would not be surprised at all if one or more of them don't go to college. And I would actually support that. I would say, sure. you, you know, again, through this, through this ROI lens, through this investment in yourself lens, right? Like if, if there's a better path, that's a more efficient path. Like I'm, you know, I'm fully behind that. You know, part of the, I, I talked a little bit about this article I wrote in, in uh, Ask Men, you know, six, six, seven years ago. Part of that, part of what I wrote in there was my journey through getting my MBA. And I got my MBA in the time period of like 2009, 2010, when there was kind of a, a you know, a, a crunch yeah, going on. And rough time. it became very clear to me that like, an MBA education was very commoditized. If you didn't go to, you know, top five and have the alumni network, like all the value is really in the alumni network, right? Then it just really didn't make sense. And, and from that moment, it just clicked with me, like, whoa, we got to take a step back. Like, it is not just education's the answer. So I'm, I'm fully on board with you there. Yeah, I, th I think the one thing to remember there is, I, uh, if you can say to yourself. I'm going to school for this reason, and I'm going to come out the other side with that job. Okay, good. You've got your path, you know, painted in, in, in clear vision in front of you. That's fine. If you're going to school because someone told you to, and you're just going for one of those bland business degrees, and you're going to get really good at beer pong, but that's about all you're going to get out of college, you really better reevaluate the whole reason that you're going there. I, I had a guy that I rented a car from us several years ago. And um, he actually was part of the impetus for me starting to write this, this book. And this guy comes from behind the counter and he had a three piece suit on from three different suits and he had his name tag on and he was really trying to put the great face forward. And I applauded him for that. But I had to wait for a while for this car. And he ended up telling me that he had $80,000 in debt from college and here he is working at this rental car place and he has no idea how he's going to pay that mountain off and then start his life. And he said, I think I got railroaded a little bit here. I really wanted to be a carpenter. And I thought, how sad is that? How many kids are going through that right now where they think if I don't, if, you know, if, if I don't use um, my, my brains for college, my parents are going to be disappointed in me or society is going to be disappointed in me somehow that's crazy. And I just, I felt bad for him. But again, that's, that's part of what you're talking about here. What, what you said there about, um, he was sort of waiting to start his life because of the debt burden. I mean, that, yeah, it, it, it's yeah. sad. And I think, you know, again, one of the answers, if we open up our eyes and we think about skill acquisition instead of prestige, you know, to your point, like you can start to live your life today and come out the other end, you know, really, really well off. So you mentioned, you mentioned your book and it's called Blue Collar Cash, Love to Work, Love Your Work, Secure Your Future and Find Happiness for Life. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the impetus for the book. Talk to me about how, um, how it's helping people and what you, you hope that it will do for people. Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So um, several years ago, I was writing a letter to my daughter uh, who was suffering from a, a pretty serious illness at the time. Um, and, and she got over it and she's brave and tough, tough as nails. And I just thought to myself, okay, how can I help her see the future? How can I help her see what life is really, or what it should all be about? So I kept coming back with these words, comfort, peace, and freedom, which is kind of, kind of a triangle because they're all dependent upon each other. And you know, you can gain comfort, peace, and freedom at any financial level. I mean, we're not all going to, you know, have 15 cars and, and a McMansion and a mega yacht, okay? Um, and if you want that, that's fine. But I love meeting people who are totally calm, comfortable, peaceful, and free in their lives. And they have these really awesome, you know, they just hit the sweet spot for their life, their debt load, their stress level, um, you know, what they enjoy, their hobbies, their charity. And, and it, that just, to me, kept coming back and showing itself. And, and if you, if you kind of couple that with all the coaching I've done over the years, I thought, you know, somebody needs to tell um, the, these kids or, or even people in their 20s and 30s, 
if you start out with what you want your life to look like first, it opens up a whole bunch of options for you that you would have never even thought you would have had. And, you know, I've had parents come to me and say, I read this book, I gave it to my kid, he read it. And now we're having conversations that I would have never thought we were going to have. Okay, real honest conversations about future and, and what it is that people want. And um, it's just been a, a really great ride. And I've had a lot of people say, you know, I was stuck in a cubicle. I went to school and I'm five years into this cubicle and I really want to build furniture. And you helped me get my side gig to a full-time gig. And I appreciate that. So it's, it's been really rewarding to, to do it. I'm, I'm very blessed for having done it. That's great. I mean, I think it's coming at a great time. Uh, I've seen statistics and I can't quote the statistics specifically, but um, you know, number of people leaving their jobs is at an all time high, right? Yeah. Voluntarily, right? And so you see all these side hustles and uh, all this literature on that. And I, I'm a product of that in the, in the tech space. And I think, you know, you're coming in and saying, absolutely, but you can actually do that here too, in, in, in all of these different spaces and be outside right. and work with your hands and you don't have to start an online course. You can do, you know, you can, yeah. you can do it this way. And so I think that's fantastic. It's very complimentary. Um, how does someone like, let, let's say they're older, let's say I'm 40. So I'm, I come to you as a 40 year old and I've been in a cubicle and I've been working on a computer all my life, right? Like, how do you, how does somebody transition from that into a blue collar job, working it with your hands as a carpenter or something like that? What I, advice had, do you have for an older person? Yeah, I've had it done like three different ways. First off, there's just ripping the bandaid off and going to work and doing something you're happy about. And I, I have a very good friend who was making about $80,000 a year at this corporate job. He's now making about 61,000 working with his hands and he's much happier. OK, mm -hmm. so you can literally just rip the bandaid off and and try it that way. Um, the other way is if if you let's assume that you have um, a hobby that you really think you can turn into a business. OK, uh, I, I mentioned the build furniture thing. Um, you know, there there are people that have these side gigs and they have these they build furniture and they take it to these fairs and shows on the weekend and try to sell it. Well, you know, you can turn, it's never been easier as well to turn an internet business into something like that. And, and there's, there's groups that can support you like, like the Woodpreneur Association and some of these other groups where you can actually get your goods and services and kind of put them on the marketplace. And you're with, you're with other people that are just like you that are trying to, to take their side gig and turn into a full-time gig. So, you know, that's another way to do it. And, um, you know, I, I just think you have, to, you have to say to yourself, you know, what's in it for me to do this, okay? What, what, how much pain can I endure to come out the other side? And I think when you make that decision, um, you know, there's something to be said, Mike, about the stand back moment. And you don't get that in a cubicle. And what I mean by that is, you know, you go landscape a front yard, plant a bunch of beautiful pine trees and flowers and mulch it all in, you get to stand back and look at that and lean on your shovel and say, I did that, okay? I built that outdoor kitchen or I framed that house or, you know, I helped those people do this or that. And I don't think you get that when you're, when you're just part of a huge cog um, in, in, a, in a cubicle setting. So I think that's very important to keep that in mind. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Um, one of the first jobs I ever had, first real job that I ever had was uh, I was a landscaper. So planting trees, laying sod and all of that kind of stuff and working with my hands and being dog tired at the end of the day. And I will tell you, I still look upon that experience yeah. really, really fondly. I mean, it was one of the, I, I just hung out, the people that I got to hang out with and, you know, and, and talk to all the time and, and just, you know, there's something about being just dead tired at the end of the day. I think that's yeah. just really, really fulfilling. Um, all right, Ken, uh, blue collar cash, love your work, secure your future and find your happiness for life. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Can you just leave us with, uh, leave our audience with how they can learn more about you, find you, order the book, all of those types of things? Yeah, so uh, you can go to KenRusk.com and, and check us out there. You can go to Ken Rusk Official, which is our Facebook page, which we, we do a whole lot of career stuff on there. 
um, talking about um, supporting people and changing careers or, or finding new careers or, or launching new, new things. Um, you know, obviously, um, uh, tw uh, we're, we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. But, um, you know, I, I, I think for me, um, you know, one of the things we're doing is we just built a, a, a quick eight week course. It's 45 minutes. It, it's eight 45 minute sessions. And we're going to be putting that out on the Internet so you can you can actually take this book and then apply it to your own life. You know, it's one thing to read a book, Mike, and you've done this and you put it on the shelf and then you go on to your life. It's another thing to take that book and put it into practical use for your life. And so that's what we're trying to do with it. So again, blue collar cash and, um, you know, hopefully we can uh, get some people to change how they're currently living that way. That's fantastic. Uh, really appreciate you coming on again and helping my audience open their eyes to just more options, right? More options that they have to, to yeah. control what they do for a living and what they do with their lives and, and how to get to, you know, where they want to go. So this has been great. I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right.